You're welcome here, uh, my dear friend. There's a lot I would like to discuss with you uh, emanating out of uh, Israel, Gaza, and Ukraine, uh, Russia. Um, and I want to focus for a while on propaganda and delusion. So first question is, is uh, in modern warfare, has propaganda itself become an end result? Well, I mean, this has been this way for some time. If we go back to the First World War, um, I mean, one of the main reasons why the United States ended up fighting on the side of Great Britain uh, against Germany um, was because of the effectiveness of the um, of the propaganda that was used to uh, to demonize uh, the German Empire and the Kaiser. Um, you know, in, in the Second World War, uh, propaganda played a, a huge role. Um, you know, but the 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 especially in the second world war, you know, we were pretty, we didn't really need to be propagandized, I guess, uh, in a, in a lengthy war where you're calling upon people to uh, tighten the belt and make great sacrifice. Um, you know, you need to keep things simple, black and white, good versus evil. And so there were big efforts to keep the home front, um, motivated about how bad the enemy was and how righteous our cause was, but it was a righteous cause. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we did the right thing in defeating Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Um, today, the you know, of course, information warfare, propaganda, whatever we want to call it, it it, it is an essential part of uh, of how we wage war today. Um, for many of the same reasons, we have to um, dumb down the argument at home, uh, making sure that people don't ask the inconvenient questions, um, uh, while you know, motivating. Uh, the nation to support conflicts which may not be um, supportable if it weren't for the propaganda. This is no longer about good versus evil. This is about implementing um, policies which, if they were exposed to the daylight that comes with, uh, you know, good journalism, uh, might not pass muster with the American people and uh, would create difficulties. So, I think the difference is today that the, the propaganda is being used for nefarious purposes to uh, deceive the American public about the reality of the policies that they're being asked to underwrite. Let's uh, start with Israel. Does it surprise you that mainstream media is almost universally uh, behind uh, the Biden administration financing of genocide? Uh, and uh, there's the, the, the only place where you get the other view is is places like this and other podcasts that have people like you and those who agree with you as guests to explain uh, another version. And the mainstream media has, has become an outlet. The Washington Post comes to mind for the American intelligence community, for the lies that they want to be spread as if they were truth. Well, look, we, we know that um, the mainstream media is, is has been corrupted for some time. I mean, just the whole you know, rotating door that takes place where people leave uh, military service or government service and they become talking heads um, on various networks or, you know, writing op-ed pieces for the New York Times, Washington Post are becoming sources. Um, and their value isn't just in what they did in their service, but who they know that's still in. So they're a conduit of information uh, from the government to the mainstream media that um, delegitimizes the notion of independent uh, journalism. Uh, these these outlets have become nothing more than, uh, you know, stenographers of, uh, of government policy or, you know, video producers that create, you know, a, a, a digital, uh, re a new digital reality. So we, we, we know this, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is, um, you know, I've been criticized heavily uh, for my, my stance on uh, Israel and on this conflict. Um, you know, one of the places that I go for information um, is Haaretz. <laughs> it's an Israeli newspaper. Um, and the, the irony is that the Israeli press will publish things about the truth regarding this conflict that the American press won't touch out of fear of being called anti-Semitic. I mean, this is, this is the ridiculous hold that the pro-Israeli lobby has on the United States, a nation that's supposed to be founded on the principle of a free press, of free speech, um, that we self-censor to the, um, to, 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 you know, to, to the extreme, and we actually censor out um, the truth as recognized by the Israeli media. Interesting uh, observation. 
Uh, and of course, there there was an op-ed in, in hot arrest over the weekend in which retired Major uh, General Yitzhak Barik uh, said things like, Israel will collapse in a year. Netanyahu has decided to die with the Philistines. He has lost his humanity, morality, norms, values, sense of responsibility. And at the same time, uh, uh, Ronan Barr, the current head, not retired, of Shin Bet, referred to Ben Gavir's uh, folks in the West Bank as uh, stirring up Jewish terror. You couldn't get away with that uh, in uh, American media without them trying to tarnish you uh, as being uh, anti-Semitic, period. That one of the, the great ironies in this, and I say this with a smile on my face, is um, I have, through my analysis, um, not as a propagandist, just as by record as an, an, an analyst, have been saying that Israel is in, in an advanced stage of collapse and left unchecked, uh, the collapse is inevitable. Um, I've even used a time frame that uh, mirrors to some extent that of the Israeli general. But when I put it out there, I'm a mouthpiece of Hamas, I'm a mouthpiece of Hezbollah, right. I'm a shill of Iran. Um, but you know that's again, shows just how decrepit this enterprise we call uh, the fourth establishment in America has become. Um, you know, we have good analysts here in the United States. I count myself as one of them who are capable of doing independent, um, you know, unbiased, uh, in the examination of the facts and come out with, um, you know, predictions or assessments, uh, that are reasonable, but if they don't go with the narrative as dictated by the pro-Israeli lobby here in the United States and as echoed by the mainstream media and indeed the government, um, then it, it simply, you can't allow these voices to be heard. And I thought the whole concept of free speech and free press was to give voice to uh, opposing points of view so that um, you know there can be debate, dialogue, discussion uh, for the benefit of the American people, we the people, who are, I, I think, able to discern between fact and fiction and decide which argument is best stated, but the government and the mainstream media don't want to engage in that debate because they can't stand toe to toe with people like yourself, the guests you bring on. I'll even put myself in that. I, I challenge you are, U.S. You government are, on a regular basis, and they you never are foremost. Take you are foremost in that uh, in that group. Well, how's it going for Israel? Who's winning the propaganda war? Israel's losing. I mean, the the the, the sad fact of the matter is you can't point to a single um, facet of this conflict uh, that has Israel winning. Everything they do only digs this hole deeper for them. Uh, every military engagement they go in is now being looked at in a new light as uh, oppression of the Palestinian people, a continuation of the genocide. Um, we There's a, a, a growing debate inside Israel right now that um, you know Netanyahu has abandoned the North and that he is focused on defending with air defense, the center, uh, Tel Aviv, um, in the in the center part of Israel, and the northern settlers, tens of thousands, are saying, "Hey, we live here. We're getting bombarded. You're not defending us. You've abandoned us." The Israeli government can't even win the propaganda fight at home. So, you know, Israel has not been served by seeking to deceive its own people and the rest of the world about what's happening. We're, again, I come back to the ability of the average person, whether it be American or not American, to discern the difference between fact and fiction. We know genocide when we see it. How is Israel doing in its war against uh, Hamas? They're losing. Again, uh, this is something that a, an Israeli general has said recently, that you can't defeat an ideology, and Hamas is an ideology. And it's like the standard arguments made in counterinsurgency or low, uh, you know, low intensity conflict. Um, you know, you have to win the hearts and souls. Every every action by Israel uh, that kills a Hamas uh, fighter or terrorist, depending on your point of view, uh, just produces more. Hamas is getting stronger, not weaker. Uh, Israel's fighting over the same uh, terrain over and over again. They go in, they bomb the rubble into more rubble. Um, they 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 work their way through it. And uh, suddenly out of the ground, out of tunnels that Israel didn't get, the Hamas fighters spring up and start inflicting casualties on the Israelis. This is a recurring base. This is why Israel's running out of spare parts for their tanks, their armor fighting vehicles. This is why their troops are exhausted. 
Um, and they just went into the West Bank, again, uh, disregarding the advice of active duty generals responsible for that area, saying that if we go in hard to the West Bank, if we commit to a major fight, we will be strategically defeated, uh, that we will end up creating another front that we can't afford to be fighting in. Colonel uh, McGregor, who actually said you might know the answer to this better than he, uh, opined that the comments by this uh, General Yitzhak Barik were actually reflecting the comments of uh, on-duty full-time generals who can't or, or are afraid to speak out. In other words, he's, he's expressing, he's reflecting the views of a lot of IDF leadership. This is standard practice. It's been the standard practice in Israel for some time now, uh, dating back to you know at least my personal experience in the 1990s. Um, you know, active duty uh, officers are prohibited by law from speaking about issues of policy. Um, Israel operates like the United States with civilian control of the military. Uh, but retired military personnel, retired security personnel, um, can, with some limitations, uh, speak out. And um, the fact that this man is speaking out um, and, and is not being suppressed by the government um, is indicative of the fact that he is the chosen mouthpiece of an active duty force uh, that would otherwise be silenced. So his words need to resonate even more. And I'll also say this, the Israeli press is a very savvy press. Um, they are loath to give voices to, um, you know, isolated opinions. Uh, if they make a decision to publish the words of a retired general, it's because they know that he is speaking on behalf of an entire echelon of active duty officers, senior officers, um, who feel that this opinion must be heard by the Israeli people. Israel does have a very vigorous and responsible, um, fourth establishment. I wish ours mirrored that. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, segue over to uh, Ukraine. Uh, what is the status of the uh, incursion uh, into uh, Kirsk? It must have been orchestrated with approval of MI6 and CIA. It was certainly funded by the United States, and we believe that European uh, officials were involved as well. Where does it stand now? Well, first of all, let me go back because I've, I've been talking to people who are um, on the Russian side uh, who please, are. Please tell us what you can. Yeah. Reconstructing. Well, I just want to be honest. You know, people, you know, when you say talking to people, I'm talking to Russian sources who right. are on the front lines uh, doing the fighting, uh, et cetera. Um, they um, have said a couple of things. One, this is a very big incursion very big incursion and the ministry of defense of russia was not prepared for it mm. so the ukrainians were able to come in and seize a um a chunk of land uh but the the russians were able to respond to blunt the attack and now they've um basically halted it and they're they're containing it um have they reduce, surrounded it no because the ukrainians still have um uh, in the border with the sumi region the, the ukrainians still have some lines of communication, but these lines of communication are susceptible to interdiction. So the uh, Russians are hitting them with artillery, hitting them with uh, air power, uh, hitting with drones, and it's become almost impossible for the Ukrainians to uh, supply or resupply the forces that are that are in. And so what's happening is they're running out of ammunition, they're running out of uh, fuel, um, and they're just slowly being ground down. The the uh, there's only one outcome, and that's going to be every Ukrainian in Russia is either going to die in, in Kursk, is either going to die, uh, be wounded, uh, retreat, or captured. Uh, they're not going to hold on to this land. But Russia's in no hurry. And one of the reasons why Russia's in no hurry is, um, you know, it, it's one thing to have a strategic reserve that hasn't been deployed yet. It's still there. It's available. It's a possibility, a potential to send things here, there, and everywhere. The strategic reserve is now firmly located in that blue spot on your map, the Russians know where it is. They have it stuck, trapped, and they're going to destroy it. They're going to kill it. Um, and from the Russian perspective, while politically it's not a good thing for them to have this happen, it's embarrassing. Um, I'm sure at some point in time, somebody's heads are going to roll. Um, from a military standpoint right now, Russia is actually in an extraordinarily advantageous spot because the strategic reserve has not only been committed, but it's stuck in a trap. 
and it can't get out to where it's most needed, which is on the front in Donbass, where the Ukrainian defenses are collapsing as we speak. The Russians are just rolling now. Uh, the Ukrainians don't have any forces left. They needed these people to be there to plug the holes. Uh, and, and we're looking at the total collapse of the Ukrainian defenses in Donetsk. And uh, in a very short period of time, it's estimated that the Ukrainians will have no choice but to abandon their positions and fall back behind the Dnieper River. And one of the reasons why this will happen is because the Ukrainians sent these troops in a curse. Now, according to the Russians, um, this force is one of the best trained, best equipped uh, forces that Ukraine has ever put together. Um, these guys are making use of cutting edge technology. They have command and control capabilities that are um, the equivalent of the best NATO forces. They integrate artificial intelligence into their, uh, you know, their scheme of operations, meaning that there is uh, satellite imagery coming in, intelligence coming in, that's creating a picture of the battlefield that allows predictive analysis using artificial intelligence about where the Russians are, where they're not, where you can get the best exploitation. And this is why they exploded in there. They came in and they were able to shoot the gaps, exploit the weaknesses um, and, and, and make advances. But, you know, the Russians have been eventually uh, cut the uh, link to the satellites. The Ukrainians went stupid. And when they went stupid, they lost their advantage. And the, and the Russians now have have successfully, successfully contained them. This force was trained to carry out offensive operations against Russia, but the training that was conducted was focused on the Zaporizhia area. This was a strategic decision made by Zelensky to take this NATO trained force, which was supposed to be fighting down in, um, in, 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 in the Zaporizhia uh, Donbass region and right. instead diverted into Kursk. Uh, the Russians now are of the opinion that um, NATO may not have known <laughs> about this, that the U.S. and the British were supportive of this after the fact, but that the initial incursion into Kursk probably took um, NATO as much by surprise as it did the Russian Ministry of Defense. Isn't it inconceivable that uh, the uh, SBK, the Ukrainian intel services, would have orchestrated this without approval and assistance of their masters in MI6 and CIA? Well, now now we're getting into intelligence connectivity. And um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think the CIA and MI6 knew about it. What I'm, what I'm saying is that this was not, unlike the 2023 counteroffensive, which was planned uh, in Ramstein, uh, you know, they trained up in uh, Grafenvir, um, right. NATO was involved in every aspect of it, up to including micromanaging the day-by-day -day actions. This Kursk incursion um, was was run without that kind of NATO connectivity, um, at, at least at the start. NATO then adjusted, and for instance, uh, the satellite feeds and everything else uh, were 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 opened up, and and uh, and it became a NATO operation. But uh, from a military standpoint. Um, the, the NATO military hierarchy was not did not appear to be um, aware that they were going to move into Kursk the way they did. Um, had they been, it, they probably would have um, strongly argued against it because this this operation has no chance of succeeding. Never were, did. Were um, NATO forces, including Americans, by what forces I mean, uh, civilian intel contractors, uh, soldiers of fortune. Uh, like our friend Matt Van Dyke, and um, maybe full-time military, active duty, but out of uniform, involved, physically involved in the incursion? There's, in terms of, you know, actual NATO forces, uh, serving officers and enlisted men in, in, in the armed forces of the member states of NATO, I don't believe that there were any, um, you know, card-carrying members of the United States military or NATO. Uh, they're sheep dipped. Uh, there were units uh, comprised of nothing but Polish troops, troops that had been serving last year in the Polish military, but now are part of the International Legion of the uh, Ukrainian Army. Uh, you know, these are Polish volunteers. Uh, there were uh, lots of French volunteers. Uh, there are units uh, of uh, uh, in the International Legion of Georgians and of Americans. Uh, there is one unit in particular um, the, the, called Ford Operation Group, FOG, which appears to have greater connectivity with the United States government than one would expect from a mercenary outfit. Um, and they 
appear not to have been involved in the initial phases of this operation, but were brought in after the fact, almost as if uh, the United States and NATO were saying, oh, well, we need to come in and, and exert a modicum of control over this or all of our investments are going to be gone because that's what happened. They poured billions of dollars into creating this strike force um, and it's gone. All the M1 Abrams tanks, the Challenger, uh, the Chieftain tanks, uh, the, the new Leopard tanks, they're in Kursk. They're being destroyed. These were tanks that are supposed to be down fighting the battle in Donbass, and they're all being destroyed. The Martyr Infantry Fighting Vehicles, the Bradleys, the Strikers, um, they're, all, they're all being destroyed right now. This was a huge investment by uh, the NATO and the United States, and it's now being squandered in Kursk. And so I think we now are seeing uh, some of these... Um, uh, black units, so to speak, um, uh, engaged inside uh, inside Kursk is uh, in an effort to stabilize the front and maybe try to save as much as possibly can be saved. But they're in a they're in a quandary right now. The Ukrainians. Um, All right, this this map that we have on the screen, which is courtesy of the Daily Mail, uh, <laughs> purports to uh, show uh, European forces that Russians um, leaked that their intel detected, their, in, their linguists so that work for the intel, detected American accents among the uh, troops. They're saying they weren't in the initial foray, but they were eventually there. No, there were American accents in the troops, but these were the mercenaries. These are the Van Dykes of the world. These are the people that um, you know have no formal connectivity with the United States. Do they, so, do they wear uh, Ukrainian uniforms? Can an American wear the uniform of a foreign uh, military? Uh, I mean, I guess the answer is yes. I mean, um, you know, RFK Jr.'s son uh, went and fought with the Ukrainians. Uh, my understanding is you don't really get into trouble unless you become a, an NCO or an officer. Um, but even then, there's exceptions to the rule. But the old the old um, adage that if you serve in the armed forces of another state, you run the risk of losing your U.S. citizenship or having your passport revoked, that's no longer the case. There should be laws about... Um, you know, committing murder <laughs> and and things of that nature, which many of these, uh, I mean, look, these mercenaries are not good people. I'm not going to cast, you know, I don't know Matt Van Dyke uh, personally, uh, but I will tell you that the majority of the Americans that go over and fight, the majority of uh, anybody goes over, right, are people who cannot integrate effectively in their own society. They're looking for adventure. Many of them don't have combat backgrounds. And, um, they're they're lawless individuals and when they get out there they uh they commit rape they commit murder they commit atrocities um and uh you know i would like to see our government hold these people accountable for what they do because even though they're not there officially you know when you have that american accent when you wear that american flag on your uh, shoulder um you know the world sees you as an american even if the american government uh, didn't give the the stamp of approval Let's go back to where we started on propaganda. Who's winning the propaganda war in Russia and Ukraine? Well, this is more complicated. The, look, the Russians aren't very good at information warfare. I mean, I know everybody's like, RT is really good and all this stuff. They, they can do geopolitics well. But from a military standpoint, the, the Russian military, the, the Ministry of Defense, is not effective in terms of how it interfaces with um, a civilian audience. They... They do a better job with a Russian-speaking audience because there's a lot of very good Russian combat reporters out there reporting from the front lines, but they report back in Russian language, either spoken or written. And for a Western audience that's not that doesn't know how to access that reporting, or if they did, they couldn't make sense of it, it it's lost on them. But the other thing is that the Russians just don't care what you and I think, Judge. Um, they're not here to please us. They're not here to serve our curiosity or answer our questions. They don't care. And so we're frustrated because we're trying to serve a broader audience by providing balanced reporting uh, based upon facts. But we end up responding to the output of NATO, of the United States, of Ukraine. They get to shape the Western narrative, and the Western narrative is largely driven by these sources. Um, the Russians... I would like to see them do a better job, but as I've been told by the Russians, why? We don't well, care what we think. The incursion have been planned for America, American propaganda purposes, to gin up support for this 
uh, support of Ukraine, so it extends beyond November 5th? I don't think so, because again, let's take a, let's compare and contrast with the 2023 counteroffensive, the great summer. You know, this one was was played up. I mean, we had a buildup. We had, you know, the New York Times running articles about the counteroffensive. Everybody, right. the, the Washington Post, man, it was all ready. We were all like eating popcorn, you know, going to the movies, ready for the counteroffensive. Curse just happened. Um, and, and everybody was sitting there going, what just happened? Uh, what that's not how you sell a sell a concept. Having people ask the question, "What just happened? Why did it happen?" Um, there wasn't enough buildup, so I don't think that Kursk was meant to be a propaganda uh, ploy. I think it was a desperate gambit on the part of the Ukrainians because they are losing the support of the West. Germany is no longer funding them the way that Germany said they were. The United States is not able to pony up like we would. Ukrainians are begging for money. They've squandered all of their military resources. Uh, this was a desperate gambit by Zelensky to be able to say, look, I can seize the initiative. I'm still here, guys. I'm still relevant. Uh, remember, at the same time that curse took place, there were stories being bandied about in the press that put Zelensky down. The Germans have accused him of ordering the attack on Nord Stream. Now, I'm not buying into that story, but that's Germany accusing Zelensky of attacking German infrastructure. Right. Um, we, we also have a, a, you know, there's open discussion uh, in the media today about a potential replacement for Zelensky. They've even named somebody, the, the Minister of, uh, of Interior, as being somebody to replace Zelensky because he has lost the, the confidence of the West. So now you're Zelensky and you're looking at all this. It looks like your allies are turning on you. You need to do something to win back the trust and confidence. Um, and so you do this bold this bold move into curse. It's failed and it's backfired on him. Um, he's even in a worse position today than he was. But I don't think this was meant to be a piece of propaganda to win over a Western audience. All right here, here he is yesterday. Yesterday, President Zelensky crowing about his successes. Cut number fifteen. One part of the plan that is already performed is in the Kursk region. Strategichne. The second part is Ukraine's strategic place in the world's security infrastructure. Svitu. The third part is a pressure package, a powerful package to force Russia to end the war diplomatically. The fourth part is economic. Nonsense? Pure insanity. I mean, this man is, you know, I'm not going to go down a certain route, but he's, he's detached from reality. This is literally um, his posture, his, his way of speaking. Uh, go to that, uh, that that classic movie, Downfall, uh, the famous bunker scene where Hitler's surrounded by his generals who are briefing him on the bad news that uh, the Russians have broken through and Steiner isn't coming and, and all this stuff. This is Zelensky on a daily basis. He lives in a fantasy world where he thinks that Ukraine is relevant. He speaks of Ukraine as being the central player in, in you know, in, in the security, you know, the, 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 the security um, conceptualization in the part of the West, as if America, when thinking about how to deal with Russia now, has to say, Ukraine is first and foremost. We have to go to the Ukrainians. No one's going to the Ukrainians right now. People are trying to get rid of Ukraine, dump Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has lost. It's over for Ukraine. But Zelensky can't accept that. So he's out here drawing big arrows on the map and talking about things that just aren't going to happen. Here's uh, the adult in the room, as uh, you and many others uh, and I have called him, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov. It's two minutes long, but it's very uh, profound and very uh, Lavrovian. Uh, and it, too, is from yesterday. Cut number 14. The West does not want to avoid escalation. Americans have this direct association, these conversations, this talk of, of a world war. They think that if this happens, it would only concern Europe, which is a very showing thing that re reflects the mentality of those geopolitical strategists in the U.S., because they are confident that they will just be safe across the ocean. And in this situation, one has to understand that we have our own doctrine, a doctrine of using nuclear weapons, among other things, and we are now making adjustments to this doctrine. And the American 
Americans are well aware of this doctrine. And, you know, these are Freud and sleep. The World War III is a bad thing because we do not want Europe to suffer. That's the mentality of the Americans, mentality of masters that are sitting on the other bank across the ocean. They are certain of their safety and security, and they are confident that there would be someone else to die for them, to do their dirty job for them, not only Ukrainians, but now Europeans as well. So we heard these speculations regarding allowing to use not only storm shadows, but also American missiles, uh, long range missiles. And in Washington, an anonymous source said that there is an ongoing effort that they are looking into a request from Ukraine in a positive light. I do not want to add anything to that. The president has already spoken on this on many occasions, and we reaffirm this once again, that playing with fire, and they are like little kids who are playing games with matches. It's a dangerous thing for adults who were trusted with nuclear weapons. Accusing the United States of being like children playing with matches and uh, revealing that the Kremlin has made, quote, adjustments to its nuclear doctrine. How do you interpret that? Well, it, it, what it means is that uh, there is no such thing as a limited nuclear war. Um, that in the United States, um, you know, we, we speak of the potential of a nuclear conflict with Russia. and We speak of Russia using nuclear weapons against Ukraine, maybe Russia using nuclear weapons against uh, certain European countries, but that that conflict be limited to that. And what Lavrov has said, and I hope everybody heard what he said, that if there's a nuclear war, the United States will be hit. I'll say it one more time just so your audience understands what I'm saying. If there's a nuclear war in Europe, the United States will be hit. And now here's the thing. Um, you know, we have an aging nuclear enterprise. We have Minuteman three missiles, which are well beyond their life expectancy. They're, they're stuck in silos that are old. Uh, the command and control is using, you know, uh, outdated uh, equipment. Um, the Russians have modernized their nuclear force. They have hypersonic weapons uh, that can reach the United States in far quicker times than we can. Um, Russia not only will hurt the United States, but if Russia makes a decision to strike, it will be a killing strike designed to destroy America's nuclear force before it launches to minimize uh, America's retaliatory um, capacity. This this is what Russia will do. And um I, I hope people will take a look at the maps of, uh, you know, what happens when, you know, 150 to 300 megaton warheads uh, uh, land or kiloton warheads land on American cities. Uh, the, the, the spread of the radiation, how long the contamination will be. Um, guys, it's over. It's game, set, match. Humanity is gone. Uh, the Russians aren't playing around. They understand the seriousness of this. And they are not going to sit back and allow the United States to play stupid games that push put the existential survival of Russia at risk. If you think Russia is going to let the United States put a standoff strike weapon, American made, on an American F-16 and pilot it with a Ukrainian and you know have these weapons be launched against Moscow and St. Petersburg, you're insane. Russia will know exactly where that attack came from, from the United States, and the United States will pay the price. This is why I say we are on the edge, on the edge of the abyss. We are closer to nuclear war than we have ever been. Look at the Biden administration. You know, how have they responded to this? They've issued a new nuclear employment guidance. This is the war plan, which will make it even easier for the United States to use nuclear weapons. So we're front-loading any potential crisis with Russia with a nuclear employment strategy that's contingent upon limiting the conflict to Europe. This is why we have a low yield nuclear weapon, the W76-2, uh, so that we can send a signal to Russia. I'm telling you right now, the Russian doctrine is clear. If a nuclear weapon of any size is detonated on Russian soil, Russia will respond with the totality of its nuclear capabilities. That's not me saying this, this is Vladimir Putin saying this. Um, that's what Lavrov is trying to remind us of. Uh, play with fire, you will get burned. But ladies and gentlemen, this isn't going to be the burning of the fingers. 
This is going to be the burning of your entire neighborhood, of your entire city, of our entire nation. Tough stuff, Scott Ritter. Thank you very much for your uh, courageous and gifted analysis. Very much appreciated, my dear friend. I hope you'll thank you. Of course, I hope you come back with us again next week.